Why are people right-handed or left-handed? The way your brain works determines whether you are right or left-handed. The left half of your brain controls the right side of your body. And the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. Because one side of the brain is always stronger or more dominant. There is one side of the body that is more developed and skilled, too. For most people, about 90%, more females than males. It is the left side of the brain that is dominant, making them right-handed, and right-footed, too. Scientists don't know why the brains of left-handed people develop in a reverse way. But it makes absolutely no difference. In fact, because left-handed people have to get along in a right-handed world, using tools, machines, and instruments designed for right-handers, they are often pretty skilled with their non-dominant hand, too. Scientists think that may be why left-handed baseball players are better hitters than those who are right-handed. There are also a few people who are ambidextrous. Which means that they can do a task equally well with either hand. And some people are mixed-handed, performing some tasks better with the left hand and some with the right. Why do I have to get shots even when I'm not sick? The shots that you get when you're not sick are called vaccinations or immunizations. They prevent you from getting certain serious infectious diseases like polio, tetanus, and diphtheria. Not too long ago, before vaccinations were used, people especially young children died in large numbers from such diseases. Most infectious diseases are communicable, which means they are easily passed from one person or animal to another through infected air, contaminated food and drink, or an opening in the skin. Ordinarily, when disease-causing germs, viruses or bacteria invade your body, your immune or defense system springs into action to get rid of the foreign organisms. Your white blood cells produce substances called antibodies that attack and destroy the invaders, helping you to recover. The antibodies remain in your body. Ready to attack the same germs before any illness develops should they ever invade again. After having one infection, you are said to have developed a natural immunity to those particular germs. But you can also become immune to certain disease-causing germs through vaccinations. Developing immunity through vaccinations is a whole lot safer than developing it naturally from having a serious illness. Taken into the body by mouth, swallowed, or injected in a shot. Vaccinations are dead or harmless versions of specific disease-causing germs, these inactive germs are unable to cause sickness but can still make the body's immune system produce antibodies against them. So if a vaccinated person is exposed to the live germs in the future, antibodies will already be present in his or her body, waiting to attack before any illness can start. Sometimes it takes several doses of a vaccine spread. 
out over time to produce full immunity in an individual. The immunity given by other vaccines may weaken after a number of years and have be strengthened with a booster shot. Why does a compass needle always point north? A magnet made of iron or other special metals that are electrically charged has two poles or ends, where its magnetic strength is greatest. Each end has an opposite electrical charge. When two magnets are held near each other, the poles that have the same charges repel each other. While the ends with opposite charges attract. The needle of a compass is a magnet and, believe it or not, so is Earth. Earth's greatest magnetic strength is concentrated at the magnetic north and south poles which are different from the geographical north and south poles. So a compass needle is attracted to the opposite electrical charges of Earth's poles. With the tip of its needle always pointing north and the bottom of its needle always pointing south. Why did dinosaurs become extinct? Scientists do not know for sure why dinosaurs became extinct. They have many different theories, some of which explain the extinction. As something that happened gradually over a long period of time. Other theories suggest that a single catastrophe caused the dinosaur population to die off rather suddenly. And some scientists believe the dinosaur population had been gradually getting smaller and then was finished off by some dramatic event. Some who believe gradual changes brought about the dinosaur's end suggest that as more and more mammals appeared, the dinosaurs had trouble competing with them for food sources. And these mammals may have eaten dinosaur eggs in such large numbers that fewer and fewer baby dinosaurs were born. Some experts believe that widespread disease killed off dinosaurs. Many suggest that gradual climate changes from continuously warm mild weather to seasonal variations with hot summers and cold winters affected the dinosaurs. Scientists are not sure whether dinosaurs were warm-blooded or cold-blooded. And there may have been some of each. If they were cold-blooded, meaning that their body temperature changed depending on the temperature of their surroundings. It would have been difficult for such large animals to survive extreme temperatures. Smaller cold-blooded creatures can burrow under the ground, for example, to escape both heat and cold. But most dinosaurs were simply too large to do that. The scientists who believe that dinosaurs became extinct after a major catastrophe point to evidence that suggests a huge asteroid, perhaps several miles wide, hit Earth. The impact of such an object would have created enormous clouds of dust and other debris. The heat of impact would have started fires over a great area. Between the dust clouds and the smoke from the fires. Sunlight would have been blocked, maybe for several months. A lack of sunlight would have caused a dramatic drop in temperature, 
and much plant life would have died. Without plants, the plant-eating dinosaurs and many other animals would have died. Without the plant-eating dinosaurs and those other animals, the meat-eating dinosaurs would eventually die as well. Some scientists argue that not all dinosaurs became extinct. The striking similarities between modern birds and some kinds of dinosaurs have led some people to believe that birds are living descendants of dinosaurs. How can you tell how old a tree is? When a branch or the trunk of a tree is cut, you can see a series of rings inside. If you count each ring, you can tell how many years the tree has lived. Each year a tree grows a new layer of wood just below its bark. Making the tree's trunk wider and wider as time goes by. The rings inside a tree often vary in size, in some years a tree has more of the things that it needs like water to produce food, which allows it to produce more new tissue. In a year with very little water, on the other hand, less new tissue would be produced, resulting in a smaller ring. How can I get a bigger allowance? One way to get a bigger allowance is to prove to your parents that the amount you are getting now is not enough to cover your expenses. Keep track of your spending for a week by making a list. Show this to your parents when you Tell them about the increase you think you should have. Explain why your expenses have changed that the price of movie tickets has gone up at your neighborhood theater, for example. If you want to save money to buy something expensive, tell them that, too. Or maybe you feel that you have grown old enough to handle more of your own expenses. Like buying your own clothes. Whatever your reasons for needing a bigger allowance, present them as clearly and calmly as you can. Give your parents time to think it over and you might have good results. How big is the universe? Scientists have demonstrated that the universe is expanding in size. With galaxies moving farther from one another, objects within a galaxy, like the planets in our solar system, don't move away from each other, however, because they are held together by gravity. Because distances in space are so huge, Scientists often use the measurement of light years instead of miles to describe them. A light year is the distance that light can travel through space in one year, which is 5.88 trillion miles, 9.46 trillion kilometers. The farthest galaxies that can be seen from Earth are thought to be 12 billion to 14 billion light years away. That means that the observable universe has a diameter of up to 28 billion light years. And that's just the galaxies we can see imagine if we could stand at the edge of one of the farthest galaxies.
look through a telescope, and see galaxies extending 14 billion light years from there. The potential size of the universe is mind boggling. It is nearly impossible to imagine the distance of one light year, let alone 14 billion of them. Why do we need table manners? It does seem that there are more rules about eating at a table with others than just about anything else. Put your napkin in your lap. Don't take huge bites. Don't talk with your mouth full. Ask for something to be passed to you instead of reaching for it. Don't start eating until everyone is seated and food has been offered all around. What is a shooting star? A shooting star, or falling star, is not really a star at all. It is actually a meteor, a small piece of matter usually made of stone and iron. Flying through space, a meteor becomes visible when it enters Earth's atmosphere. As it falls toward Earth, it becomes heated from friction with air molecules and becomes incandescent, giving off great light. Most meteors burn up completely before they hit the ground. If they do make it to Earth, they are called meteorites. What are bugs? Most people use the word bug when talking about insects like beetles, bees, and butterflies. And other small, many-legged creatures that crawl, jump, or fly, such as spiders and centipedes. All of these critters belong to the same phylum, called Arthropoda. Which also includes crustaceans, like lobsters and crabs. Arthropods have hard skeletons on the outside of their bodies. Called exoskeletons, and they also have jointed limbs, arthropod means jointed feet. Arthropods make up more than 80% of the world's animal species. The word bug does correspond with an official category, though, in the scientific world. A true bug is classified as an insect that belongs to the order Hemiptera. The insects in this order can be recognized by the X-shaped pattern on their backs. A design formed by their wings at rest. They also have sucking mouth parts and a hardened gula, which is the underside of the head. The 30,000 species of the Hemipteran order include bed bugs, fire bugs, and some water bugs. What is the deadliest mushroom? The most poisonous mushroom is the death cap toadstool, Ammonita phalloides. It is commonly found where beech and oak trees grow. Even a small piece of it can kill, usually within 6 to 15 hours. Unlike some poisonous plants, the poison of the death cap toadstool is not destroyed by cooking.
Do any lizards live in water? Lizards need to breathe air, so there are no living species that live in water all of the time. Several species of lizards can and do swim. Spending part of their lives in the water looking for various freshwater organisms to eat. Only one species, the marine iguana of the Galapagos Islands, is known to get its food from salty seawater. It eats seaweed and algae, and some marine iguanas have been known to dive underwater in search of food for periods of up to half an hour. As they eat, marine iguanas naturally swallow lots of salt water, but they are able to remove the salt from their bodies because they like all iguanas, have salt glands between their eyes and nostrils. These glands concentrate and remove the salt, depositing it in the iguana's nostril. The lizard then gets rid of the salt by sneezing. The resulting bit of salt that shoots out of the iguana's nostril is used to scare off potential enemies. Why was the Statue of Liberty built? The Statue of Liberty, officially named Liberty Enlightening the World and sometimes referred to as Lady Liberty, was built in the late 1800s as a symbol of the friendship between France and the United States. France had supported American efforts to gain independence from England in the 1770s. And the United States had returned the favor during France's revolution of the 1780s and 1790s. A joint effort between the two nations, the statue was designed and built in France. While the 154-foot, 47-meter, Concrete pedestal was the responsibility of the Americans. Intended as a gift to celebrate the 100 year anniversary, or centennial, of American independence, which happened in 1776, the statue was designed by sculptor Frederick Augusta Bartholdi. He had help from many engineers and designers including Alexander Gustave Eiffel, the man who designed the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France. Lack of funds in both countries slowed down the construction of the statue. And it wasn't actually completed until 1884, eight years after the centennial. It took nearly a year for the statue, which was broken down and divided among more than 200 crates to travel across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States. And it was another whole year before the pedestal was completed. Finally, on October 28, 1886, the Statue of Liberty was officially dedicated in front of a crowd of thousands. Made of copper and steel, the statue, which depicts a woman who represents the concept of liberty. Stands just over 151 feet, 46 meters, tall, plus the height of the pedestal. To give an idea of just how big the statue is, bear in mind these statistics, her index finger is 8 feet. 2.4 meters, long. Her nose is 4.5 feet, 1.4 meters, long, and the width of her mouth is 3 feet. 0.9 meters. Lady Liberty holds a torch in one hand, symbolizing enlightenment or freedom from ignorance. 
the other hand holds a plaque that bears the date of American independence, July 4, 1776. What do the letters on M and M candies stand for? During the 1940s, when M and M candies were first introduced, two men headed the company that made them. Mr. Mars and Mr. Murray ran the M and M candies company, which has since become Mars Incorporated. And they put the initials of their last names on the colorful treats. The letters used to be printed on the candies in black, but since 1954 the MS have been white. If evergreens keep their needles all year long, why are there so many on the ground? A conifer doesn't keep each of its needle-like leaves forever. The needles usually have a three or four year lifespan, after which they are shed. A conifer is different from a deciduous tree in that it loses its leaves gradually. Rather than all at once. So a conifer always looks green. The same thick outer covering that keeps evergreen needles from. Losing water in their often dry environments also keeps them from decaying quickly once they are discarded. That is why you see so many dry needles on the ground under mature evergreens it takes a long time for these needles to decompose. Especially compared to the leaves that fall off deciduous trees. How does a copy machine work? Most photocopiers are machines that use static electricity and powder. Rather than ink, to print copies on plain paper. Once you place the page you want reproduced onto the glass plate on top of the copy machine and close its lid. A strong light inside sweeps across the page. With the help of a lens the image from your page is reflected. On the outside of a turning metal cylinder or drum below. Invisible positive charges of static electricity create an image on the drum. Dark parts of your image are more strongly charged than light parts. Negatively charged black powder called toner is dusted across the surface of the drum. Sticking most to wherever the positive charges are strongest. Then the drum. Rolls across a blank piece of paper, and the powder is transferred to its surface. In order to make the powder stick, though, it must be melted onto the paper. This melting occurs when the paper passes through heated rollers. Your copy is now complete and slides out of the machine. This dry ink method of copying works well because images instantly stick to the drum and are just as quickly removed. Enabling the photocopier to be ready for immediate reuse. The process is repeated from beginning to end whether you want more. Then one copy of your page or need to copy a new page altogether. Why do most things bought in stores have bars and numbers printed on them?
the groups of lines and numbers that you see on the packaging or labels. Of most items in a store are called the Universal Product Code, UPC. Widely used in the United States, the series of bars holds a coded message that allows a computer to exactly identify the name and size of each product and the company that makes it. The numbers accompanying the lines give the same information. But the bars can only be read by a machine, while the numbers can be read by store employees. When you buy an item in a store, a worker passes the item's barcode in front of a reading device. A beam of laser light scans the barcode. And its unique light and dark pattern is changed into on and off electrical signals. These signals travel to a computer, which identifies the item and sends information about it to a main store computer or to one located in the business's main office. To help keep track of the store's stock of that item, for instance, the computer is also connected to a cash register, which can print the item name and price on a receipt. UPC symbols have made it easier for retailers to keep track of merchandise and to learn what kinds of items customers want to buy. It saves purchasers time in the checkout line. Helping store employees ring up items quickly and accurately. Do zoo animals hibernate? Animals that hibernate in the wild do so because temperatures drop and food supplies become scarce. In the zoo, however, animals live in a controlled environment. They are given a constant supply of food and warm pens. Or buildings to retreat to when it gets chilly outside. Some animals, including bears, may get sluggish during the coldest months at the zoo. But they will not spend months at a time sleeping as they might do in the wild. Why is it easier to float in salt water than in fresh water? It is easier to float in salt water because the salt makes the water heavier than fresh water. If you had two gallon jugs, one filled with salt water and one with fresh water, the one with the salt water would weigh slightly more. And the denser, heavier, the water, the easier it is for people and objects to float in it. An object can float in a liquid when that object's weight equals the weight of the water it displaces. Or pushes away, the water is displaced in order to make room for the object. Here's another way of looking at it, when you sit in a bathtub, you can see the water level rise. If you remove the amount of water that was pushed up by your body. It would weigh the same as your body does. When the water is dense, like salt water is, less of it is displaced by your body. It takes less water to equal your body's weight, and you float higher than you would in fresh water. Where does our food come from?
people in industrialized nations like the United States eat food that comes from all over the world. Such countries have the wealth to buy food products that are brought by plane or ship from far away. A wide variety of canned and packaged foods are available from every corner of the globe. And even fresh foods like fruits, vegetables, fish, and meats can now be sped across oceans in refrigerated boats. So foods that were once rare treats are now available at nearly every time of the year. Arriving from places with different climates and seasons. That means that the asparagus and strawberries you eat may be grown nearby or halfway across the world. Today, when you look in your cupboards, it is like taking a trip around the world. You will see tea from India, coffee from Brazil, olive oil from Italy, and much more. In the past, people ate only the food that they could produce on their farms or find at their local markets. That is still true of many people who live in developing nations. Why is kindergarten important? In the United States, public schooling begins with kindergarten, when a child is about five years old. Kindergarten is a half day of classes in an elementary school. While most of the activities in kindergarten are play activities like singing, storytelling, and drawing children are also learning basic skills through these activities that they will need throughout their lives. These skills include listening to directions, using their time well, and working in cooperation with others. Kindergarten helps children adjust to school slowly, going only a few hours each day. It bridges the gap between the age when kids spend their days playing, at home, or in daycare or nursery school. And the more formal learning that will begin once a child enters the first grade. A German educator named Friedrich Froebel opened the first. Kindergarten in 1837. Its name is German for Garden of Children. What is gravity? Gravity, or gravitation, is the force of attraction that exists between any two particles of matter, or any two objects. It is the force that holds planets in their orbits around the Sun, or the Moon in its orbit around Earth. As the distance between two objects increases, their gravitational attraction decreases. Gravity is also the force that holds any object to Earth or to any other heavenly body instead of allowing it to fly into space. The larger an object, the greater its gravitational pull. That explains with American astronauts that landed on the moon could leap about with little effort. With the moon much smaller than Earth, its gravitational pull is one-sixth as strong as that of our planet. Gravity also explains why Earth and other planets and heavenly bodies are fairly round in shape. When our solar system was formed, gravity drew the dust and gases hurtling through space into lumps. When a great amount of matter is pulled together at one time, 
it crowds together into the shape of a ball because gravity pulls everything toward a center point. Still, Earth is not perfectly round. As it rotates on its axis, the spinning causes an additional force to pull against gravity. Making Earth bulge out a little around its middle. Why are sweets so bad for my teeth? The sugar and starch in the foods you eat are what tooth damaging germs or bacteria, in your mouth like best, as bacteria feed on these food particles. They produce acid that dissolves the hard outer covering, enamel, of teeth. Sweet and starchy foods, like candy and potato chips, that stick to your teeth are the most damaging. Snacking on these foods between meals increases the damage they do. For each time you eat such foods your teeth undergo another acid attack. It is best to eat sticky sweet and starchy foods at meal time, mixed with other foods. In fact, it really makes sense to eat your dessert first instead of last. So that other foods can clear some of the sugar from your teeth. Tell that one to your parents. Why do I have to go to the dentist? About every six months to a year, you should make a visit to your dentist's office. A dental hygienist there will give your teeth a good cleaning. Removing built up and hardened food and other substances that can't be taken care of through regular brushing and flossing. And that could lead to gum disease if not removed. Then your dentist will view your teeth with a tiny mirror. Looking into hidden places, searching for cavities and decay. When cavities and tooth decay are not detected early. They can become serious, causing pain, infection, and even tooth loss. If your teeth have fillings, your dentist will make sure that they are in good shape. X-rays of your teeth and jaws may be taken, too. To show cavities and other dental problems that cannot be seen during a regular examination. In addition, until you are about 13 years old, you will receive a fluoride treatment. Every year while the hard outer covering of your teeth, enamel, is still forming. Fluoride is a chemical that strengthens that enamel, helping it to resist decay. What is the largest bird? The ostrich is the largest living bird, some extinct species were larger. Found primarily in Africa, the male ostrich can grow to be nearly 8 feet, 2.5 meters. Tall with its neck making up almost half of its height, females are a bit smaller. Ostriches can weigh almost 350 pounds, 159 kilograms. These flightless birds travel in groups and can frequently be found in the company of other grazing animals. People have harvested ostrich feathers for hundreds of years to decorate hats and other items. 
and in recent years ostrich meat has become more popular. Why do certain smells trigger vivid memories? You're at a school fair, and you walk past the cotton candy machine, getting a whiff of the sweet smell. Suddenly you have a strong, clear memory of the trip you took last summer to. An amusement park the memory so vivid it feels like you're actually there. Which lizard is the biggest? The Komodo dragon, part of the monitor family of lizards, is the largest living lizard. It can grow to be 10 feet, 3 meters, long, and it can weigh up to 300 pounds, 136 kilograms. The Komodo dragon has been known to attack and kill humans. And sometimes it will even eat members of its own species. But generally its diet consists of carrion, which is the flesh of animals that are already dead. Found on Komodo Island in Indonesia, this lizard has been popular with collectors of rare and exotic animals. And because of that the Komodo dragon is nearly extinct. The Komodo dragon is now protected by laws that prohibit people from hunting or capturing it. What is a weed? Strictly speaking, a weed is simply a plant growing where it is not wanted. Weeds usually grow easily and spread, and they often interfere with the growth of more desirable plants. Weeds don't usually have nice features, like pretty flowers or tasty leaves. To make them more appealing to people or other animals. They are frequently hard to get rid of, growing back from the smallest bit left in the ground. People's opinions vary greatly about which plants are weeds. In the United States, for instance, most people consider dandelions weeds and spend a lot of time and effort trying to get rid of them. In France, however, they are grown as a crop. With their leaves used in salads and their roots processed to make a coffee-like drink. What is a toadstool? A toadstool is simply a mushroom, the reproductive part of certain fungal growths that has an umbrella or cone-shaped cap on a straight stem. Because mushrooms often grow in cool, moist, dark places, where most toads like to live. And because they are shaped like little stools, the name toadstool arose to describe them. Usually the term toadstool is used when talking about a type of mushroom that is not suitable for eating or is poisonous. The practice of calling such mushrooms toadstools may have come from the fact that some toads emit poisonous fluid through their skin.
How are newspapers made? People usually read newspapers to get information about current events. Things that are happening at the present time or have just occurred. So when the people that work for a newspaper learn about something that would make a good news story, they move quickly. Reporters are immediately sent out to gather as much information about the situation as possible and photographers take pictures that add visual information. When they return to the newspaper office, the reporters type their story into a computer. And camera film is developed into photos in a dark room. The photographs are put into the computer with a device called a scanner. Increasing numbers of photographers use digital cameras. Which means their photos do not have to be first developed on paper. They are automatically in digital, or computer ready. Format and can be transmitted over phone lines or via satellites just like email or other electronic files. Once the photos are in digital format, the printed story and the pictures that illustrate it are arranged together. The story may take up part of a newspaper page or may extend for a few pages. Designers arrange all the stories and photos that make up a newspaper into visually appealing. Easy to read pages on the computer screen. They are then printed out on pieces of clear film. Next. The film print of each newspaper page is laid on a light-sensitive metal plate. When it is exposed to a flash of bright light, shadows of the film's letters and pictures are left on the plate. The shadows are permanently etched or marked into the plate when it is soaked in acid, which eats some of the metal away. What is left is a perfect copy of the film print of the newspaper page. With its words and pictures appearing as grooves in the metal. The newspaper page is now ready to be printed on paper. The metal plate is first wrapped around a roller on a motor-driven printing press and coated with ink. After being wiped clean, ink still stays in the grooves. When paper, in big rolls, is passed under the roller. It is pressed into the grooves, and perfectly printed pages appear. This process is repeated for each newspaper page. As you can imagine, printing plants are enormous, with some presses standing three stories tall. These expensive machines, costing tens of millions of dollars. Can print and sort up to 70,000 copies of a newspaper per hour. Once the press is done printing and sorting, the newspapers are bundled for delivery the next day to homes and newsstands. Long before computers and motor-driven presses, Printing was done by hand with wooden blocks of letters and figures dipped in ink and pressed onto paper. It is believed that this method of printing was invented in China around the year 700. A hand operated printing press with movable type or letters was first used in Europe in the mid 15th century. Johannes Gutenberg printed the first book, a Bible in what is now Germany. In 1455. Until that time all books and other manuscripts had to be written out by hand.
What is the lowest place on Earth? The lowest place on the surface of Earth is believed to be in the Mariana Trench. Located deep in the western Pacific Ocean, extending southeast of the island of Guam to northwest of the Mariana Islands. It reaches down 36,198 feet, 11,034 meters, below sea level. Where do medicines come from? Medicines or drugs are chemical substances used to prevent, treat, or stop diseases, to heal wounds, and to stop pain. Since ancient times, people have used natural products from plants, animals, and minerals in the earth to help themselves and others. For example, a substance called digitalin, found in the leaves of the flowering foxglove plant, has long been used to help people with heart problems. Likewise, the dried sap of the seed pod of a certain poppy plant, opium, has a long history of use as a powerful painkiller. Even today, about 25% of all the drugs that doctors prescribe and many more medicines that can be bought over the counter. Meaning without a prescription are made from plant products. Scientists have yet to explore the full potential of plant-based medicines. Many useful plants come from the world's rainforests, which are unfortunately being destroyed at a rapid rate. Companies that make drugs study the healing effects of natural substances and try to recreate similar substances in laboratories. They test these and other man-made chemicals on samples of diseased and ailing cells. On animals, and sometimes on people over long periods of time. If these substances are shown to be useful, Without causing harmful side effects, they are then sold as new drugs. In the United States, a government agency called the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, controls the testing and marketing of new medicines, making sure that they are safe and effective. Why are rainforests so important to the health of our planet? In 1800 there were 7.1 billion acres of rainforest in the world. Now, just 200 years later, less than half 3.5 billion acres remain. Over 100,000 acres of the world's rainforests are destroyed each day. With trees cut down for their valuable wood and land cleared for farming. While covering just 2% of Earth's surface. The dense vegetation of these forests plays an important role in the health of our planet. The destruction of rainforests threatens the health of our planet by Reducing the amount of oxygen in our air and increasing carbon dioxide. Too much carbon dioxide in our atmosphere keeps the sun's heat from radiating back into space. Increasing global temperatures, called the greenhouse effect. Global warming, in turn, could bring about major climate changes. 
melting glaciers and rising sea levels, for example, could cause flooding of coastal regions. The plants in rainforests produce natural chemicals that fight off destruction by insects. And scientists have learned how to make plant-based insecticides from rainforest plants. Without destroying the rainforests, to spray on crops. These natural insecticides are far less toxic than synthetic, or human-made, chemicals. Numerous medicines as much as one quarter of all prescription drugs have been made from materials gathered in rainforests. And many more life-saving medicines may await discovery there. Many products like natural rubber, essential oils used in cosmetics and perfumes, and rattan. A material weave together to make furniture can be taken from rainforests without causing widespread destruction. In addition, rainforests can absorb huge amounts of water. When rainforests are destroyed, the vast amounts of rainfall in those regions cannot be absorbed, resulting in widespread flooding. Fortunately, International efforts have begun trying to save what remains of the rainforests by helping the people who destroy them find other ways to earn a living. Still, the destruction of these important forests continues at a rapid pace. What is a fossil? A fossil is the hardened remains or an imprint of a plant or animal that lived a very long time ago. Some fossils are thousands of years old, others are several hundred million years old. Most plants and animals died and then decayed without ever leaving a trace. But some were buried under mud, rocks, ice, or other heavy coverings before decaying. The pressure of these layers over thousands of years turned animal and plant remains into rock. Usually fossils preserve the organism's hard parts the bones or shells of an animal and the seeds, stems, and leaf veins of plants. Sometimes the fossil is the actual animal part, like a bone or tooth, that has hardened into rock. Some fossils, called trace fossils, show the imprint of parts of the animal or plant. Occasionally these imprints act as a mold. And the sediment that fills the imprint hardens and becomes a cast of, for example, a dinosaur footprint. Sometimes bones or trees are preserved by minerals that seep into the part's pores and then harden, or petrify, that part. Arizona's petrified forest contains numerous examples of giant trees that were petrified millions of years ago. In some cases, an entire animal is preserved in ice. Hardened tree sap, called amber, or in dry, desert areas. In these instances, as with woolly mammoths found in Alaska and elsewhere, the whole animal hair, skin, bones, internal organs is preserved much as it was when it died thousands of years earlier. What is fog? Like clouds, fog forms from tiny droplets of water that 
have evaporated from moist soil or from bodies of water. Fog is basically a low-lying cloud that touches Earth's surface. Water vapor in the air condenses to form fog under many circumstances. On cool mornings, the warm water vapor coming off lakes or ponds meets cold air and forms steam fog. Fog can also appear when a cool front of air meets a warm front. Technically, fog is not fog unless visibility the distance you can see in. Front or behind you is reduced to about one half mile, or about one kilometer. What is an eclipse of the sun? Once in a while the moon passes directly in front of the sun as it makes its way around earth. It temporarily blocks out the sun, casting a shadow on a portion of earth that is experiencing day. When this total eclipse of the sun a solar eclipse occurs. The part of earth affected becomes dark and cold until the moon passes by. Surrounding areas experience a partial eclipse. Where just part of the sun is temporarily covered by the moon. What are tears for? Tears keep the delicate surface of the eyeball clean and wet. Tears are produced in glands, called lacrimal, above the outer corner of the eye. They spread across the eye surface with each blink. A blink takes about a third of a second, and most people blink about every six seconds. When you add it up you spend more than half an hour each day blinking. Tears that wash across the eye usually evaporate into the air or drain into tear ducts. Two tiny canals located at the inner corner of each eyelid. From there they pass down into the nose, where they keep nasal tissues moist. That's why you have to blow your nose when you've been crying. When you cry or get something in your eyes. You may produce more tears than the system ordinarily handles, and they may spill out onto your face. Why do cats have whiskers? The whiskers of a cat are part of its sense of touch. The long stiff hairs are called vibrissae, and, just like our own hairs, they are connected to nerves at their roots that send information to the brain. A house cat usually has 12 whiskers on either side of its nose. As well as a few above its eyes, on its cheeks, and behind its front legs. These long, sensitive whiskers are particularly useful at night, when many cats are most active. They can give a cat information about surroundings that it can barely see. Whiskers can help a cat feel the distance between objects, letting it know if it can pass between them. Some scientists think that cat whiskers are so sensitive that they can feel the air move around objects. Keeping a cat from bumping into them or helping it to travel safely over uneven ground.
Why are there seven days in a week? Callers are not sure why it was decided that a week is seven days long. There are many different theories. The beginning of the Bible states that the world was made in six days, and on the seventh day God rested. This biblical source, however, does not explain the seven-day week established. In societies that did not know of or follow the teachings of the Bible. One widely held theory explains that in ancient times, many civilizations all over the world believed that each day was governed by either the sun, the moon, or one of the five planets that were then known. Because each of the seven astronomical bodies ruled one day, there were seven days in a week. Before the seven-day week became widely accepted, many societies based their week on the amount of time between market days. If it was decided that farmers needed nine days to accumulate and transport their goods to the marketplace, and the market day was the tenth day, then the week was ten days long. Why do bees, wasps, and other insects sting? An insect's sting is a defensive weapon used when it senses danger. It was developed to keep predators away from it or from its colony in a hive or nest. It is designed to pierce the skin and inject a poison or venom into the predator. If you have the bad luck to be stung by an insect, there are a few things you should do. First, move away from the hive or nest if one is nearby. A stinging bee sends out a chemical signal that excites other bees. Second, try to remove the stinger from your skin by scraping it with something hard instead of pulling it, which could squeeze the attached venom sac, releasing more of the irritating substance into the wound. Put some ice on the sting to ease the swelling and pain. If you develop a lot of swelling, a rash, or, most important, have trouble breathing. See a doctor, because you are having a serious allergic reaction. Which bird has the largest wings? The largest measured wingspan belongs to the wandering albatross. A large seabird that can be seen gliding over southern oceans. When spread, its wings can measure nearly 12 feet, 3.6 meters. Their long, narrow wings allow them to fly great distances with minimal effort. Albatrosses can glide for several hours without flapping their wings once. Their gliding ability helps them save energy. Which comes in handy when they have to fly hundreds of miles in one trip to find food for a just hatched baby. Albatrosses only come to shore for breeding. And they are unusual among birds in that the female only lays one egg each year. Most birds lay several eggs a year. Ducks can lay around 10 eggs at a time, for example. Baby albatrosses require a lot of care from their parents. It can take them almost a year to grow the feathers they need for flying. 
and during that time the parents must search far and wide to get food for the whole family. Albatrosses eat fish and squid, and sometimes they follow boats, looking for food scraps. At one time sailors believed that killing an albatross brought bad luck. An idea explored in the famous poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Others ignored that superstition, catching the birds on baited fish hooks for their meat and feathers. How do plants grow? Special cells in plants produce hormones. Chemical messengers that tell different plant cells to perform certain activities. Plant hormones are responsible for things like fruit development. The death of flower petals and leaves, and, most importantly, for growth. Cells in stem tips, new leaves, and buds, for instance. Produce various growth hormones that tell plant cells to multiply by division or to become larger. The pattern of growth in plants offers an important example of how they differ from animals. While animals eventually become fully grown, and live for a long time after that point. Plants never stop growing throughout their life cycles. In other words, there is no such thing as an adult plant that no longer grows but continues to live. How many bones do I have? Babies are born with about 330 bones. But many of them join together during the process of growing up, creating fewer, larger bones. Adults have 206 bones. Some PEOPLE end up with a few extra bones, though. In the arches of their feet or as an extra set of ribs in their rib cage. Many bones are shaped to protect and support soft body parts. The curved bones of your skull, for instance, enclose and protect your brain, your body's command center. The ribs form a cage that protects your heart and lungs. Your wrists, hands, ankles, and feet contain more than half the bones of your body. Usually the more bones, joints, and muscles you have in a spot, the more flexible it is. That is why you can make such small, precise movements with your hands and feet. Like tying a bow or balancing on your tiptoes. Why can I sometimes feel my heart beating? You usually only notice your heart beating when it is working faster than usual. When you are resting, your heart usually beats about 85 times per minute, slower in adults. But when you are active, your muscles need more oxygen and nutrients. It's your heart's job to increase the amount of blood that flows. Through your body delivering what your muscles need by pumping faster. After a real workout, your heart can be beating twice as fast. And it may feel like it's pounding in your chest. When you become frightened or excited, a similar thing occurs. 
the hormone adrenaline, which prepares the body for emergency action, is released into your blood from glands, along with your brain and nervous system. Hormones chemical messengers that circulate in the blood help control body processes. Adrenaline tells your heart to pump faster in an instant fight or flight. Response that has helped people survive dangers from the beginning of time. Your heart makes sure your muscles are ready to fight. Or run from the thing that has frightened or excited you. What were some of the biggest meat-eating dinosaurs? For many years Tyrannosaurus rex, whose name means king of the tyrant lizards, reigned as the biggest and meanest of the carnivorous dinosaurs. At 40 feet, 12 meters, and with a head nearly 5 feet 1.5 meters long and teeth 6 inches 15 centimeters long t Rex was definitely not a dinosaur you'd want to meet face to face but some dinosaur bones discovered in the early 1990s show that t Rex was not the biggest carnivorous dinosaur ever to have terrorized the planet. Giganotosaurus, pronounced Giganotosaurus, was slightly longer at nearly 42 feet, 12.6 meters, long. It lived about 30 million years before T. rex. Scientists believe there are other ferocious meat eaters that were even larger than the Giganotosaurus. Why are the oceans blue? Like the blue appearance of the sky, oceans, and other bodies of water only appear blue. As you know if you've ever scooped some of that water into a clear container and seen that it isn't actually blue. Scientists believe some bodies of water appear to be blue. Because of the same principle that makes the sky look blue. When sunlight, which is white light consisting of many wavelengths that each correspond to a different color. Hit sea water some of its wavelengths are absorbed. Others especially the wavelengths that give us the color blue are scattered after colliding with water molecules and reflected back to us. So if water is clear, without too much dirt, algae, or other material floating in it, and at least 10 feet deep, it will appear blue to us. Water that has a lot of dirt or other floating particles can appear brown, green, or gray. What is Indian summer? In the United States, the term Indian summer refers to a period of warm, dry weather that sometimes occurs during autumn. Some people say a true Indian summer can only happen if this period of warm weather comes after the first frost, which is when temperatures are cold. Enough at night for water droplets on grass or car windshields to freeze. 
Indian summer is so named because it is believed that in past centuries, when such days of unexpected good weather came. Native American Indians would use that time to gather more food for winter storage.